Hello. So today we're going to go over 1.4C and 1.5B, okay? And in this section, we're covering quadratic equations and applications. So essentially, we're going to go over the quadratic formula, and then we're going to talk about how to solve word problems using that quadratic formula, and then what happens when we get imaginary numbers when we use quadratic, when we use the quadratic formula, okay? So let's go ahead and begin this concept. So here it says, often in mathematics, you are taught the long way of solving the problem first, just so that we can see where everything derives from, okay? Then the longer method is used to develop shorter techniques. The long way stresses understanding and the short way stresses efficiency. For instance, you can think of completing the square as the long way of solving the quadratic equation. When you use completing the square to solve quadratic equations, you must complete the square for each equation separately. Okay, so if we have, um, once you do have something that's completed the square, so essentially what they do is they take this, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, okay? And then they complete the square. So the first thing they do is move over the c. Then the next thing they do is they divide by the a. And then they complete the square. So they add um, one half of b over a squared. So then this part factors into x um, minus b over 2a. And then over here, you have c over a plus um, b squared is b squared. 2a squared is 4a squared. Um, and if I want to get a common denominator here, I would multiply by 4a and 4a. So I get negative 4ac over 4a squared plus b squared over 4a squared. Um, and then if I were solving for x, I would have to take the square root of both sides. So I can write this as one big fraction and I'm gonna write positive b squared in the front and the minus 4ac in the back. And I'm taking the square root and you do get plus or minus when you take that square root. Here the house and the square will go away Okay, and then the square root of this, the square root of the top does not simplify. And the square root of the bottom is just 2a. And then if I add this b over 2a, it'll become positive. And since they share the same denominator, we get b, um, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, okay? Um, actually, I get plus because this would be positive, right, in there. So this should be positive. And so then when I move it over, it actually becomes a negative b, okay? And so that's just the deriving. So this is the long way of solving a quadratic. You would take it, you would get it set up for completing the square, you would complete the square, and then you would start solving for A. And so instead of having to do all this process every single time, they did it once with the random variables A, B, and C, so that they basically created a formula. So instead of having to do this by completing the square, and instead of having to do this by factoring, you now have a nice little formula that tells you, if you have this as an equation, you will get this as your solution, okay? And so that's what we're going to essentially be using. So we'll never have to complete the square from now on to solve a quadratic equation. We can just shortcut it and um, use the formula, OK? Now it says you should learn the verbal statement of the quadratic formula. So it's negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. In the quadratic formula, the quantity under the radical sign, b squared minus 4ac, is called the discriminant, okay? Um, and it can be used to decide whether you're going to have real solutions, um, the number of real solutions. So if b squared, oh, I think they talk about it down here. So if the 
if this thing right here, which is what is underneath the square root, okay? If that is positive, then that means you're gonna have the plus or minus of that positive square root, which means you're gonna have two different, that's what distinct means, two different real solutions. However, if this inside is zero, then you're basically plus or minusing zero, which means you only have one answer. And so you'll have one real solution. But if it's negative, you can't have negatives in the, under the uh, square root sign. If you do, that means they're imaginary, okay? So for that case that the discriminant is negative, that means you're not gonna have no real. What you do have is complex solutions. And you always have two complex solutions. Two complex solutions, okay? Also, I learned a cute little, it was a student of mine that, that said that, I guess it was how his high school teacher taught it to him. And it just stuck with me because it really does um, play out. So it's, he said that the negative boy couldn't decide whether to go to the house party. He didn't want to be square and miss out on four awesome chicks but the party was, and the, and the party would be over by 2 a.m., okay? And so that was just something that they used to remember. I've heard some others, um, but for some reason, that's the one that I remembered. Um, so it is kind of cute to, to use if you know what the things are. So the negative boy couldn't decide whether to go to the house party or not. He didn't want to be square and miss out on four awesome chicks and the party would be over by 2 a.m., okay? Um, but anything that you can do to try to help yourself memorize that formula, the better off you are. Now, keep in mind that you will have um, the formula provided to you, but when you get to pre-count calculus, they're gonna expect you to have that memorized, okay? It says, if the discriminant of the quadratic is negative, in the third case, right, then the square root is imaginary, not a real number. And so then therefore you'll have two complex solutions. Okay, I already mentioned that, but they just decided to use a whole page to say that. So here's the first example, solve this equation using the quadratic formula. Well, in order for me to pick out the A, B, and C, it does have to be equal to zero. So notice that the first thing they did was subtract nine from both sides to get zero, and then x squared plus three x minus nine. So then according to what we have, we know that a is equal to one, that's what's in front of x squared, b is equal to a positive three, that's what's in front of x, and c is equal to negative nine, that is my constant, okay? Um, so we're going to plug all of these into the quadratic formula. So we've got negative of B plus or minus B in parentheses. And I highly recommend that you do plug in all your numbers in parentheses when you put them in the formula. If you don't, you're likely to misunderstand what you're supposed to be doing, like whether you're supposed to be subtracting or, or multiplying, okay? So you've got negative of three plus or minus three squared minus four times one times negative nine over two times one. So then the negative three just becomes negative three. This is nine. It's actually nine minus, well, actually that would be a plus 36, which is where this 45 came from, okay? Because it would be nine minus a negative 36, which is just nine plus 36. Then the square root of 45, if I type that in my calculator, you get three square root of five. And then if this was also a three, I would factor out the three and try to simplify it, but I can't. So all they did was just write one of those fractions with the plus and write the other fraction with the minus, okay? And if WebAssign asks you for the decimal representation, you can type those in your calculator and then you'll be able to give them that decimal representation of the number, okay? Now, as for our applications, it says, um, quadratic equations often occur in problems dealing with area. Here is a simple example. A square room has an area of 144 square feet. Find the dimensions of the room. Solve this problem that x represent the length of each side of the room. Then the formula for the area of a square to write the, solve, to write the equation. So x squared, length times width, right? Um, and they're both x 
long, x units long. And so then you can solve this by taking the square root of both sides and you get x equals plus or minus 12. But x equal to negative 12 doesn't make sense in this problem because your length cannot be negative, okay? And so then we do figure out that the room should be just um, 12 feet. So again, that's just saying the same thing. You do get both of them, but one of them doesn't make sense in context of the problem. Now here's another example. A rectangular sunroom is three feet longer than it is wide and has an area of 154 square feet. So I don't know how wide it is, but I know that the longer side, the length, is three more than this measurement here. Okay, And we also know that when you're trying to find the area of a room, it's the length times the width. So the width is W, the length is represented by three more than the, than the width, um, and then the, you know that the area is 154. So you've got length times width equal to your area. So you distribute your W, you get this, you minus the 154 over, you can factor that or solve it using the quadratic formula. And when you set each of those factors equal to zero, you get these two solutions. Again, this one does not make sense in context of the problem. So we know for sure that the width is not 14 feet. However, we do realize that the width is 14 feet, is 11 feet. And if you're trying to find out the length, you remember it's the width plus three. So the length is the 14 feet, okay? Um, and then you can check it, just make sure that 14 is three more than 11 and make sure that when you multiply the 11 times the 14, you do get the 154 square feet. Now, another kind of application that you'll see has to do with projections, okay? So it says, um, involves objects that are falling or being thrown, projected into the air, um, and they have a general formula to give the height of such an object, okay? And this formula is for the position equation. So it literally tells you where the object is as it's falling or as it's projected and then falling, okay? Um, and so on the Earth's surface, this is literally just for Earth because we have gravity and that's where the negative 16 comes from. You will learn a whole lot more about where that negative 16 comes from um, later when you get to calculus. For right now, we're just going to take for granted that they're telling us it's negative 16 and it has to do with our gravity, okay? Um, but here is the equation. So S represents the height of the object, okay? Usually they'll tell you the measurement that says in feet here. Um, if it were gonna do it in another measurement, you wouldn't use negative 16, you might use a different number, okay? Um, but that does have to do with your gravity. Then V naught, it's like V with the subscript of zero. It's called V naught, K-N-O-T, naught. Okay, so V naught represents the initial velocity of the object. And then S naught, not snot, not like boogers, <laughs> um, no mocos, um, just S-K-N-O-T, S naught represents the initial height of the object in feet. Okay, and then T represents the time in seconds. So um, another application that you might see is uh, having to do with triangles. Okay, so if you see triangles, remember that you do still have the Pythagorean theorem, which we have talked about um, in a previous section. Okay, and remember C is the, the side across from the right angle and the other two sides are called legs. So now we can talk about what happens when we have these complex solutions. So we already know that if you have the square root of a negative number, essentially what you can do is take that negative out as an I. So notice that the house does not go over the I, okay? Um, and when you do that, you can uh, then have imaginary or complex solutions. So for instance, it's asking us to solve this quadratic equation. I'm sorry, didn't mean for that to come out. <laughs> Um, so here your A is equal to three, your B is equal to negative two, and your C is equal to five. And it is already equal to zero, which is what allows me to identify the A, B, and C, okay? If it did not have equal zero, I could not tell you this information yet, okay? So now that I do have it, I am gonna plug all of that into my formula. So negative of this value B plus or minus the B squared minus four, a, C, all over 2A. And so this, you simplify first, you get positive 2. 
This you simplify next, that's gonna be a positive four minus 60, which is a negative 56. That negative will come out as an I. And if I type square root of 56 in my calculator, square root of 56, it does tell me it's two square root of 14. So essentially you'll have two square root of 14, but with an I on the side, which is exactly what's happening here. Okay, you got that two square root of 14 with the I on the side, and then it's divided by six. So essentially what you would do is you would separate this into two over six plus or minus two square root of 14 over six with the I on the side. And then these can reduce. Remember, you cannot reduce what's in the radical with things that are not inside a radical. So you can reduce that to one third. You can reduce this to one third, but the one is invisible here in front of the radical. Okay, and so you do get your two complex solutions. Now, trying to get to this practice problems. Okay, so it says solve the quadratic using the quadratic formula. So it does have it equal to zero. So I can say A equals one, B equals eight, positive eight, and C equals negative four. So X is gonna be negative B plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So this becomes just negative 8 plus or minus 64. And then this will all be plus 16 over 2. So I get negative 8 plus or minus the square root of 70, 80 over 2, which is negative 8 plus or minus the square root of 80 does simplify to four square root of five over two. And then you can split the fraction. And I get those reduced to negative four, these reduced to two, but you still got that square root of five sitting there. So you do have two solutions. You have this solution, and then you have this solution. And these are your two answers there. Okay, now practice, let me leave that there in case you wanted to take a screenshot. I'm pausing the video to see. Then here we have the floor of one story building is 14 feet longer than it is wide. So the floor, I'm guessing that's a rectangle. So we know that it's 14 feet longer than it is wide. So I don't know how wide it is, but I know this is that measurement plus 14. Um, and it says it has um, 1395 square feet floor space. Floor space is your area, okay? So they're essentially telling me my area is 1395. So it says write a quadratic equation for the area of this um, floor in terms of W. So we know that um, length times width equals our area. So length is W plus 14. Width is W and A is 1395. So I can write, distribute this. I get W squared plus 14W equals 1395. I can even subtract that 1395 over and I get zero, okay? And so this is going to be my response for part A. That is my quadratic equation, okay? I could have also given them this line I just didn't, I like to get it equal to zero. Now for part B, it says find the length and the width of the floor. So for part B, instead of trying to factor this, especially with the large number like 1395, um, it is easier just to do the quadratic formula. So A is equal to one, B is equal to 14, and C is equal to negative 1395. So I have negative B plus or minus B squared minus four A, C all over to A. So I get negative 14 plus or minus, and then I'm gonna type this whole thing. Don't try to type the whole fraction in there because if it's imaginary, it will not simplify it for you. And you're just gonna do all that work for nothing. Only figure out what's going on here and what's going on on the inside first. Once you know that, if it's positive, you can simplify the radical. And if it's negative, um, you can 
take the i out and then simplify it, okay? So square root of 5776 happens to be a nice number. Um, it's just 76. So I have negative 14 plus 76 over two and negative 14 minus 76 over two. This one is going to be a big negative number, like negative 90 over two, which is negative 45. We know the negative answer doesn't make sense for a width, okay? Because remember, the variable here is w. So w equals this values. And it doesn't make any sense for w to be negative 45. So if I take the other one, I get 31, okay? And so then 31 does make sense. And if I wanna know the length, that's gonna be um, w plus 14, which is 31 plus 14, which equals 45, okay? So you know the length and you know the width. So now we have practice two, it says solve the quadratic, using the quadratic formula, it does already have it equal to zero. So A is equal to one, B is equal to negative four, and C is equal to a positive 13. So we have X equal negative of B plus or minus B squared minus four A C all over two A. So I get a positive four. And then inside there, I'm going to get um, negative four squared minus four times one times 13. I do get negative 36. Now we know the negative can come out as an I. So you get square root of 36 with an I and the square root of 36 is just six. So if I do four over two plus or minus six over two with the I on the side, we get two plus or minus three I. So your answers are two plus three i and two minus three i. Screenshot there. Now we move on to this problem here, which is a little bit harder. So we do have some extra space here. So give me a second, I'm gonna fold my pages so I can get this in here correctly. Um, so we do have a lot of extra space down here. So it says, let me move my little box out of the way, it's in my way, there we go. So it says, use the position equation given below where S represents the height of the object and V represents the initial velocity and S represents the initial height, T represents the time. And here it is again, right? So it says, you drop the coin from the top of a building, the building has a height of this. So that's where you start throwing the coin. So that means that this is the initial um, height. That's how high the coin was at the very beginning before you dropped it. It says, use the position equation to write the mathematical equation, okay? Um, it does not tell me how fast it's falling though. So I don't know the velocity just yet. Um, oh, there is no velocity. If I'm dropping it, then I didn't, push it downward with any kind of force. So this velocity will be zero, okay? So if you're dropping the coin, that means that your initial velocity is zero. You're not like throwing it down. It's just, or throw, tossing it up. So that means that my equation is gonna be S equals negative 16 T squared plus zero T plus 914. You don't need to write the term with the zero T. So it's just negative 16 squared plus 914. Then it says find the height of the coin after three seconds. So all I'm going to do is plug in three here. And this will be negative 16, three squared plus 914. And I get 770. So that would be how high it is after three seconds. Now, last part, it says, how long does it take for the coin to strike the ground? Well, if it's hitting the ground, that means that the height is equal to zero. So you have zero equal to negative 16 T squared plus 914. And you've got to solve that equation. Now that equation is not too bad to solve. I'm going to minus 914 on both sides. I'm going to divide by 16, 
let's see, what's 914 divided by 16? Um, we get 57.125 equal to t squared. And then when I take the square root, I get plus or minus, oops, um, 7.5581, da, 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 da. So remember the negative one doesn't make sense for time, right? Only the positive. So it does say round to two decimals. So the time would be about 7.56 seconds. And that's what you get for that one. So you could definitely use these as examples when you're working out those couple of word problems that are very similar to this one. But this is the end of um, 1.4 slash 1.5.